So let's go through a review of last week's lectures. Okay, so last week we um, we went through um, more details on uh, direct conversion receiver and uh, you know simple math, and then we looked at I and Q, and I kind of fooled you into believing that uh, how it works. But that's like um, um, just looking at the I output, right? But you all know now that uh, that's not true. Um, and I wanted to do this intentionally so that you get a false sense of correctness first and then you see the real details later on, right? Um, so spectra is not exactly accurate, you have to do I minus JQ and we saw that at the end of the lecture. Uh, then we talked about all the different challenges that uh, direct conversion receivers have, uh, LO leakage uh, being one of them, DC offsets and we talked at length. Uh, how that DC off offset will impact you based on uh, some, you know, uh, rough calculations, okay. And then, um, then we talked about different solutions to DC offset, the first one being the AC coupling and then uh, the elaborate DC offset cancellation uh, using DAX, okay. Then, uh, then we went through even order uh, distortion and then that's where this IP2 business came into play, right, if you, if you remember. Uh, basically, um, uh, the two tone um, at high frequency uh, due to IP2 of the LNA creates F2 minus F1 at low frequency, but then it jumps over because of the feed through over the mixer, okay, and then uh, then it shows up in band, and that's the reason we are worried about the IP2 of the LNA, okay. So I think that's clear, uh, and that's the reason kind of we did that first example. Then um, again, you know, I wanted to give you a heads up and about the test, so flicker noise we talked about, I made sure that you understood what corner frequency was and I, I think most of the people uh, did the right uh, equations for that. So, um, but the, the examples that I have given in the test, that is kind of the way you operate when you are actually designing circuits. People will give you flicker noise corner, then you have to do this back of the envelope quick calculations and figure out should I really work, get worked up about flicker noise or not. And that was the intent and you could see that flicker noise does not really do much, uh, do a dent in your equations, okay. Then we talked about a quick uh, chopper stabilization, what it does uh, and then uh, IQ mismatch, uh, what does that do to your uh, bit error rate and then one quick one about LO pooling. And uh, then uh, this part I think I am going to skip because it was all basics, uh, IQ analysis, complex algebra. And I just wanted to make sure that all of you are on the same solid footing and that is why I wanted to do it in the class, okay. Uh, because if you are not comfortable with this then you will, um, you will get really confused uh, when you start looking at receiver analysis. So today um, we are going to start on the LNA design. So one thing I want you to remember is. Um, when we do these analysis that I am going to show you in the classroom, right, um, at points it will feel like we are doing a lot of computations calculations, but as I have told you many times before, you should be able to uh, quickly make a determination and pick out the, pick out the important, uh, you know, components and then run with it, make approximations and, you know, verify the approximations. So the intent of the analysis is to, uh, to quickly get an idea about who is important and um, and then, um, then when you do simulations you should see the trends, trends are important because many times you cannot compute things to the last dot uh, because the circuits become very complex, uh, rarely you will see a simple, um, very simple circuits where, uh, where you have to, you can do hand analysis, okay. But you should, you should have your concepts clear, if I do this, this happens, if I do this, this happens in the basic circuit and then you do it in simulations and you kind of uh, figure, confirm your findings, okay. Uh, but but the lot of complex circuits you you have to deal with simulator at that. Point. But if you don't have the fundamentals right, then the simulator can easily fool you into believing anything you want, and you can totally draw wrong conclusions based on the simulator. Okay, so it's it's really important to understand uh, these fundamental equations and the trends based on the fundamental equations, and that's the intent of all these calculations we are going to do. Today. Okay, so the intent is quickly. Uh, figure out, you know, um, put few numbers, ignore R out, 
those kind of things judgment calls you have to make and then then you add more to that uh, if you are doing a PhD thesis then you add R out if you are doing masters then you ignore R out for a minute and then kind of do the quick calculations and then you know the higher the complicated uh, second order third order analysis effects you want to put in then you have to put that in. So the first thing uh, we worry about as I, as I told you in the beginning of the course is input matching. And this is kind of uh, I am giving you a reference uh, 12.3. So um, you can read up that chapter of course it is lot more detailed and a big chapter but then um, I have picked material from different different textbooks and different things I learned on the way and I am kind of putting uh, the, the combined uh, juice here ok. So MOSFETs are inherently capacitive input. So it is difficult to provide um, 50 ohm match uh, without uh, unless you do something uh, I mean obvious right. So as is. So the first method is brute force. What is brute force? If, if something does not work you make it work somehow it does not matter what the result is. So this is what uh, the brute force mechanism is and that is what we call it I mean when you go design things it is called brute force match. So we have this uh, device and looking in is capacitive that is what I said right. So it is not 50 ohms so obviously it is not going to match which means you are not going to be able to deliver power to the MOSFET. So what do you do you put a voltage divider here and this is your RS and this is your RN equal to RS and this is your source voltage yes ok. So Rn equal to Rs. So since it is a brute force match it is a fairly broadband mod match it does not depend much on the frequency unless the CGS starts coming into play and that generally happens when you go close to FT. What is the unfortunate part? There is a signal attenuation at input right. So Vn is equal to Vs divided by 2, Vn being this is the Vn and what is the next one? Rn is a real resistance right that we are intentionally uh, yeah he is right absolutely. So noise is a problem it contributes noise ok. So now that you know this right uh, the question is how do you compute noise figure of this circuit. So that sounds like a daunting task right but let us go step by step and figure out how to do that and method is what is important. So learn the method apply the method same basics every other circuit that you are going to learn. So let us do um, this is your RS, this is your RN and this is the noise due to the RN part. So V RN square and this is V RS square. The notation is clear to you right that is a noise, a noise due to that particular resistor ok and then what else we have? We have this GM VGS and what else is there for the MOSFET? drain uh, no R out we are going to ignore right now because we are trying to look at really fundamental uh, things. You have a noise uh, current source that is the I N D square you remember this right we went through the noise uh, analysis earlier and then you are doing R L RL, RL we are just assuming it is noiseless right now. So one more thing I have ignored here is 
1 over f noise and what else ig. If you remember I had taught you about gate noise right. So, for the sake of discussion let us keep things simple once we understand then you can add another layer on it ok. So, let us do the analysis. Um, uh, so, the VO is equal to R in plus R in plus R s. I am assuming that there is a match between at the input. So, R in is equal to R s and that is multiplied by V R s plus V R n ok and that gets multiplied that is the that is the voltage at this point and then that gets multiplied by the G n right and then plus we have I n d. Right now I am not showing any squares or anything, but I just want to show as if you are doing a Kirchhoff's current law and voltage law and that times R n. Is this equation clear? Huh? Straightforward analysis right. Now, what we do is we do noise powers. and then you add them because they are uncorrelated because these two are resistors and this is the drain noise current. So, they are not correlated. So, you can add this add them as squares ok. So, V out noise square is equal to R in divided by R in plus R s square and then V R s square plus V R n square and then G m square plus I n d square R l square. Is this step clear? This is an important step. Yes, no? Ok. Alright. If, if something is absolutely confusing, please raise your hand now because I am building things piece at a time. So, uh, if one person has a confusion probably there are three four more people having confusion. Very good. I, I knew somebody is going to ask me that question because I did this mistake when I was doing it. Then I said ok I am going to justify it later on saying that R n and R s are equal ok. All right. Good. Excellent. Excellent thinking. What he is saying is if you look at this V R s right ok. Then the drop is going to be across R n. But if you start from V R n, the drop is going to be across R s, right? So, how are you fooling me saying that both R n divided by R n plus R s? That was the question, right? You got the question, right? Ok, all right. So, uh, what I am saying is R n and R s are the same. So, anyway, in the next part of the equation, uh, I am going to take care of them. So, I did not bother correcting, but he picked on me. That is good. Ok, so all right. So, then let us go move on to. Uh, so, this is the total output noise and then. What is the noise due to the resistor? Just the R s source resistance it is given by I am hearing some rumble can you please not do that because I get tuned out otherwise ok and V R s square times R l square G m square. Is this part clear? All I did is I am just saying uh, what is the um, what is the noise due to uh, source source resistance. Ok. And then our standard noise figure equation is F is equal to um, V out noise overall noise <coughs> at the output divided by um, due to V n R s ok. Noise due to that contribution of that in in there. So, then you can get you can easily see it will look like this. V R n square divided by V R s square plus R n plus R s divided by R n square I n d square G n square V R s square ok. All I did was I took this equation and I divided this by this equation and after that slight amount of algebra ok go ahead. No, you do not want I mean they are all uh, uncorrelated right. Ok, uh, good question. So, 
typically when you when you do the noise analysis right the polarities don't matter because you square them you are adding noise powers right no not clear you can choose plus or minus whichever way you want but when you uh, when you try to put together powers you square that whole term so far you are you are you are with me i i divided this by this and then this is what you get okay okay so let's go uh, to the next step so then uh, let's say r in is equal to rs and what is i and d square guys you should tell me now is equal to it's fresh in your mind right you studied for the quiz 4 kt gamma gdo and delta f right and what is vrs square 4 kt rs delta f okay so let's plug those in and then you get f equal to 2 plus because this part again uh, becomes 1 is that clear this part become because we are uh, noise due to resist these two are the same right because we use the same resistor so that became 2 and then you will get 4 divided by gm rs and then gamma over alpha and you remember alpha right alpha was gm over gdo and um, for long channel devices alpha is equal to 1 gm and gdo are the same thing and for short channel devices alpha uh, goes down reduces okay and gamma is equal to 2 over 3 for long channel and then for short channel this will increase even factor of 2 it could be more okay so gamma increases for uh, short channel okay all right so so far is clear right all right so what's the if you if you do it in dbs what's the minimum noise figure at least 3 db right and it's more than that so is that a good number nah because that means um, you know you right away you you add the same amount of noise as the source resistance right at the input right so sometimes it might be okay when you have large signal and you don't care about noise figure and matching is very critical right so then it's very easy to do the matching just put a resistor there and be happy wide band match okay and noise figure is not important but most of the circuits you want the noise figure uh, to be really good and you can you know right at the input you can't kill yourself like this okay so this kind of you use it only if you have to and also this gets worse uh with high frequencies why is that what happens your gate noise starts coming into play which we ignored conveniently in the beginning goes up okay so far you are with me so you understood the the fundamental of how do you start computing noise figure so we just did a simple circuit now we start building more and more complex circuits so let's do next one so the second one is um, and these are again various topologies of the lnas that uh, that i'm exposing you to of course you know there are various combinations but these are kind of the key things that uh, that you mix and match okay it's called shunt series feedback you guys remember feedback shunt series feedback eh uh, no yes yes or no yes okay good so what is what does shunt mean and what does series mean very good excellent i mean so this is output voltage that's what you're sampling sensing and then you are adding uh in uh, adding with uh, input voltage that's the feedback part okay and that's in series okay a simple topology to do that is uh, you have a vs rs okay and then you have the device and then i'm just going to add another resistance here and then i'm going to add another r and ground 
Now I am using ground because I am dealing with small signal analysis. Okay, um, you had that question, right? Um, so we are doing small signal analysis. We are trying to figure out noise figure. We are not trying to do distortion. If it's distortion, then again, you know, you have to deal with it differently. And then you add a feedback resistance RF. Okay. So RF is large. So if RF is large, then can you can you quickly figure out just by looking at the circuit? Uh, what is uh, VI and uh, gain of this circuit, voltage gain from VO to VI, do you know how to do that just by looking at this circuit, huh? what is it, very good, what, what you said RF by, huh? minus RF by, that is not right, okay, okay, alright, so let me, let me teach you a trick, right, first of all, RF is large in the beginning, okay. Then, um, then um, this is a source follower circuit, right. I am not going to go through uh, the equations part because you should know this from your analog class. So, source follower what happens from gate to source? It follows, right, the voltage follows. So, whatever is VI here, it will be here. Is that clear? And then that is the same current that is going to flow through this guy, R1, right. And that is the same current that is going to flow through this. So, VO is equal to V O over V I is equal to minus R L divided by R 1. Is that part clear? Okay. That is kind of the quick way you have to kind of learn, slowly learn these techniques so that every time you do not want to draw the small signal analysis because then you will get wound up in that and you will give up and say I do not want to do this anymore. I will go to digital design. Okay. So, do not do that. These, these are the simple tricks that you have to learn and once you master these tricks, um, then nobody can catch up with you because most of the people do not want to master those tricks and they will just walk away, I will do software or something. So, you have to kind of, you have an advantage right now, I am giving you these subtle tricks that you have to master, okay. Alright, so this part is clear and then, uh, so that is my AV and what is RN? RN is the impedance looking in here, okay. So, RN is, you know something called Miller effect, you have learned that, right. So, let me show the Miller effect. So, you have A V here and you have let us say some impedance Z, okay. So, whatever V you are putting in you have A V times V is, is coming over here. So, what is the current that is going to go through this? It is V minus A V V divided by Z, right. So, that is kind of the way uh, the way you do this. So, R in is given by uh, Rf divided by 1 minus Av, which is equal to Rf divided by 1 plus Rl divided by R1. Okay, so we use Miller effect. It's clear, right? So what's the advantage of this? Basically, I can um, I can easily get a 50 ohm match input match by choosing uh, right values here, right, because I can choose RF to be large, then I can choose this RL over R1 ratio to be large and then by division I can get 50, 50 ohms and that is a fairly wide band match. Now, let us look at R out. So, similar analysis you can do and I will leave it to you, uh, there you have to do uh, I can show it to you, but I do not want to spend too much time on the grunt work right now because there is lot more interesting stuff to cover. I mean, if I go into this, then uh, we will spend 10 minutes over there. So, uh, uh, are our, that this, oh, I did not explain that. This is the output. Uh, okay, okay, all right. Got it, got it. Okay, let me explain. So, from here to here, it's a source follower. So then I said this is approximately same as this one. Okay, and then I said the current flowing through this is this divided by the resistance. Okay, and then I said the same current has to flow from here, right? So then I'm multiplying that, uh, you know, that current, and then uh, the voltage developed here is going to be then R L divided by R R one. 
Yeah, we're going to go. Oh no, input impedance is infinite, right? So, it is reducing. Originally, it was the gate, open gate, right? Now, I made it 50 ohm. Impedance is reduced. Right? At the input. Did I make a mistake? But this is called, okay. Yeah, how you combine them together. Okay. Okay, let me let me put a note to myself and clarify this. Okay. You are, uh, but then you are also, you are creating a voltage that goes in series with your input voltage, right? Okay, let us not latch on to that right now, but uh, I will satisfactorily answer that question to you. Okay. Because, um, but finally, this is the answer. Okay, this makes sense, right? So uh, to calculate R out, you have to do this. Look at it this way. Again, I'm just going to give you the trick of how to do this. And this is your R1, and this is your RS, and this is your RF. So you you introduce uh, V out, and you compute the I. Are going in to V over I, right? So then um, the this uh, this is dependent on GM times uh, VG minus VS. So VG being this one and VS being this one. Okay. So just write simple equations based on this, and then um, compute the current flowing here and compute the current flowing here. The current flowing here is going to be VS over R one. Okay. All right. So if you do that, you will quickly see. Uh, it comes out to be RF plus RS divided by R1 plus RS times R1. That is, since RF is large to begin with, it is RF divided by 1 plus RS divided by R1. Okay. So, here also uh, an interesting fact, you can match output also by the same token. The way you did input matching, you can do output matching also. So, this was a very popular topology to do simultaneous input and output match. So, in early days when you had to design a, a LNA which is like a component, then you have to do input and output match. So, by doing all these things, you can do um, 50 ohm matching at the input, 50 ohm matching at the output, okay. Simultaneous input and output match. What are the bad things about this? You have RF contributes thermal noise and um, the Z in right now is definitely not equal to Z opt if you remember that all that complex analysis we did long time. So, the noise figure is higher than the minimum. But broadband match, you get broadband match. You understand what I mean by broadband match, right? Broadband meaning uh, over a very large range of frequencies. Uh, in tuned circuits, you generally operate within the you know within the bandwidth of the that net network, right? If you remember. But here, it, it, there is no tuned circuit here. There is no inductor, nothing. Here. So you can get acceptable noise figure here. Uh, the reference for this is Razavi 5.3.2 if you want to kind of dig in further and you can do the same noise figure analysis and all that good stuff for this one. So, let us um, look at uh, another technique called third technique common gate. Stretch. So, here what you are doing is you are using the GM of the device to create 50 ohm matching.
So, what is the impedance looking through this source? 1 over G m. Now, all these things they should you should know them um, and some people who have not taken the, the analog class you really have to go through those lectures. So, that this becomes second nature to you otherwise you will be totally lost in this class going forward because we have to use those uh, quick uh, tricks to kind of move forward ok. So, all you have to do is choose the device size. and I bias to get uh, 50 ohm match. So, here if you um, do the small signal modeling of this thing right, I am I'm, I'm connecting the gate to 0 and then this is my uh, GM VGS ok and then uh, I and D square that is the noise current of the gate ok and then this is your R L and that is where your V out is and this is the I O and that you have a resistor R S at the source and then you have this V R S square. Is this model clear? I am just uh, you know writing the small signal model. So, here you can uh, again do the same noise analysis that we did before uh, you know take one piece at a time and figure out what is the contribution to the output and then divide by the source resistance component. It is all KCL KVL ok no magic way. and what you will get I would like you to uh, prove this on your own. Uh, so, all these mechanical exercises you need to convince yourself I am giving you the result and intuition behind it and method of how to get it, but you have to practice on your own ok. So, you have to prove yourself f is equal to 1 plus gamma divided by alpha ok. So, this is 2 third and this is 1 and it could go down. So, for long channel you are going to get uh, noise figure equal to uh, 1.33 right and I think that is uh, 2.2 dB ok. So, you are getting better now and for short channel what happened oh sorry I am sorry 1.6. So, short channel what will happen is it going to go up or down up always. So, short channel always messes you up remember that because gamma will go up and alpha will go down. So, they both go in the opposite direction. Also at high frequencies Ig comes into play. So, you have to look at that also. So, all these techniques we have we are seeing so far right we are somehow using a noisy component to emulate that 50 ohm combination right. You are saying that in the first example we actually use a brute force resistors as other examples what we did what did we do? We did feedback to emulate uh, there also you have to put resistor and the third one what did we do? We, we looked at the source of the uh, source of the device and made that 1 over gm look like. Uh, so, somehow we want to figure out if we can do better than that right. Why not use some different so, that we do not add noise at the input itself. So, there are different techniques. So, I am going to teach you another one. So, the, so, uh, the thing we are trying to figure out is how do you effectively uh, resistive input without noise here ok. That is our for, but to do that I have to build it up. So, let us do a analysis here you can do see it. RL goes to ZS and then try to figure out what is this ZN. So, again you know you have to do and there is a reason I am going through um, rather than giving you results I am going to go through this analysis with you. So, that is GM VGS plus minus VGS and this is your CGS ok 
and then we are putting in a test voltage source VT and we are trying to measure what is IT and then on the bottom you have your ZS and this flows through RL. Is the model clear? All I am doing is I am replacing the transistor model with a small signal okay? and then, um, then we will just do 2-3 calculations and we will see. So, first of all um, VGS is equal to IT divided by SCGS, agreed? The VGS is here and then uh, that IT is going to go through that and then going to produce SC this, okay. IR instead of R, you have 1 over SCGS, okay. Now, VT minus VGS, which will be the voltage at this point, divided by ZS, which would be the current flowing in this CS is equal to the current IT that is coming through this capacitor and the current GM VGS. Clear? So then um, in this you can substitute VGS and then what you will get is VT is equal to 1 plus GM ZS. VGS plus IT ZS and that is equal to 1 plus GM ZS divided by SCGS IT plus IT ZS. So far you are with me? So our definition of input impedance is uh, Z n is equal to V t divided by I t which is equal to I am just going to break it up now. So, first thing is 1 over S S C G S plus Z s plus G m Z s divided by S C G s ok. So, that is the input impedance. So, now let us uh, figure out what if you use resistive degeneration? Okay. So, I think most of you probably know what degeneration means. Anytime you put something in the source of a MOSFET, you are degenerating, you know, you are making it bad, right. So, you are degenerating that guy. Uh, so, here instead of ZS, let us say if I use a resistor, what will happen? So, then you can uh, again, you know, use the same equation. So, Z in becomes 1 over S C G S plus R S plus G M R S divided by S C G S which is equal to R S plus 1 plus G M R S divided by S C G S. Okay. So, the Z in looks like now um, like this. So, you have R s and then you have C g s divided by 1 plus G m R s ok. But again resistor is a noisy device. Second thing we try is a capacitor. So, Z s will be equal to 1 over S C G s. So, then you can substitute again and what you will see is uh, this is what you will get minus G m over omega square C s C G s and C s parallel C G s. So, this kind of generates negative resistance and it is sometimes used in oscillators. So, 1 upon SCGS, right? 
Oh, oh, I'm sorry. This one. Okay, good. This is what you wanted, right? Okay. Thank you. So, um, other thing to note is, um, so whenever you do these circuits, right, um, you can um, this source follower circuit. I mean, this is a classic. Uh, uh, don't do that. DDT, I like to call them. Uh, whenever you use a source follower to drive a capacitive load, you're in trouble. You can already see that, right? You get a negative uh, resistance and you get oscillation. So, uh, especially if you have a pad that you're driving and you have a capacitor, right? Then these circuits oscillate and I have seen it firsthand when somebody did not simulate with the pad capacitance and then the circuit came back and it was oscillating. So, so capacitive degeneration does not do you much good, right. So, parasitic cap, it can oscillate. Hmm. No, no, that you can do separately, right. I am only showing you the AC part. You have to do biasing separately, okay. Yeah, yeah, you are absolutely right. I mean, you can have a current source there, right? Current source is a high impedance, and that current will uh, it will allow the current to flow through. So, for example, I mean, there are many ways you can do it, right? You can do a you can do a current source, right? And then you can have this cap like this, and the Z, the impedance of this could be very high. Okay, very valid question. Though. Good. So, right now. Uh, I am not showing the DC circuits uh, about biasing the transistor. So, we are only looking at the AC analysis. So, you know what are the key components that we are putting around the device to do the uh, to achieve the results. But then when you are building the real circuit as he said you have to put biasing structures around and then you have to make sure that those biasing structures do not contribute to noise that is really important. So, um, so obviously I am doing the the most important piece at the end which is inductive degeneration right. So, here Z s is equal to s times L s right. So, then Z n our original equation that becomes s times L s plus 1 over s c g s plus G m L s divided by C g s ok. So, let me go back again to the previous equation that we derived ok. You remember this equation right ok. So, all I did was in Z s I substituted s times L s. So, you can see 1 over s C g s plus s L s and then this this is the interesting part what does that become G m times s L s divided by s c g s and then s and s cancel out and what do you get voila you get a resistance this is a resistance right because there is no s component here. So, that is this resistive component. So, this is the real part and that we can make it into uh, for resistive matching. And what is the cool thing about it? We did not use a resistor to create this. So, there is no added noise due to this component because inductors do not have noise, capacitors do not have noise. Created without using noisy R. And the circuit looks like equivalently like this. Okay. So, what is the matching equation? G m L s divided by C g s is equal to what is that G m over C g s is 
omega t l s is equal to 50 ohm which is the r source pretty neat huh? okay all right so the key key facts to remember here right so z in it's resistive only at resonance So, it is a narrow band impedance match and many times it is desirable the reason is that you um, you are trying to op process only certain band right. So, you design your equations such that you can uh, use only that uh, that bandwidth and then for rest of the stuff it does not match any. So, the signal is not delivered to you. So, you get an added benefit in that sense. Whereas, in the other um, wide band matching circuits there is no protection from those you have to do some extra filtering. Yeah, you had a question. Why do you? Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. I think uh, CGS is is the capacitance across the. We are always using it, right? Okay, guys, guys, calm down. Okay. Huh. Huh. That the first one we did not use the CGS because we use the resistor matching, right? So it's kind of bandwidth independent. So, in this case, uh, okay, I get your confusion now. Your your question is why am I using this CGS uh, only in these cases, right? So, in these cases, uh, if you uh, if you do not take CGS effect, right, then um, what will happen? I mean, this part will basically go away in, in this equation, right? And the uh, this effect you know we, we would not be able to capture. So, typically what happens is you actually put additional capacitor there you add another extra capacitor to to you know kind of play with all these numbers you can add an extra capacitor uh, along with CGS also to make all these things happen. I still have not answered your question. No that capacitance is what gives you this effect right I mean you saw this equation. No, not clicking. Okay, uh, say the question again. Maybe uh, I am not following your question. Correct. So, there we ignored CGS. So, correct. Correct, yeah. In that case, we were just doing resistive divider action, and whatever CGS was there, it is going to uh, hurt you only at very high frequencies, right. The is this one you are talking about? This correct. We did the resistor part. No, no. But by the by the fact that CGS is around that transistor, it will transform. It will transform the impedance, right? Which is what we did using a simple small signal analysis. No, in the previous case, it doesn't do that. It doesn't do that because that there is no feedback. Right? It just presents itself. The CGS just presents itself, right? And it just feed forward network, right? CGD will come into play there if you want to really do fine analysis. Have I answered your question? Because those were like straightforward. Uh, here it becomes the CGS becomes active part in in deriving that equation. But good question. It's definitely good question. Okay, so let's uh, zoom into this now. Um, so many times you have to. Uh, in this particular case, if you remember uh, omega naught is equal to 1 over square root of L s times C G s right, because it is a series uh, R L C network if you remember. That uh, center frequency of this uh, this network series resistor. So, uh, many times you want to play with that see a frequency 
So then you can either play with the CGS or you can play with LS. Okay. Many times you want to lower the because omega, the CGS could be really small and LS could be whatever LS you need. LS is fixed, right? Because once you do 50 ohm matching, then LS is fixed. We cannot change LS. So then this frequency is fixed. Then now what to do, right? Then I cannot. I can get all these results, but they happen to be at a frequency where it's one over. Uh, you know, this is the center frequency. So to play with it. To get additional handle, what you do is the following: you add a uh, series inductor LG. This is your RS. LS, and I'm again showing explicitly the CGS. Okay, so if you do that, then the Z in becomes. Omega T LS, which is what we showed before, plus one over SCGS, and the inductive part becomes S LS plus LG. Okay, so what did I do again? See, this inductor just appears in series, right, from the previous equation. So I just I just added that in this equation, which is uh, right here. Okay, it's in series. Am I making sense? No. If I am not, then I'll go back. So, what I'm saying is, if you remember this previous uh, derivation, where did we do that? Somewhere here. Okay, in this one, right? We have this um, Z S, and then the Z in. If I add another um, uh, another inductor here, at this point, right? Then all you have to do is add S L S in series. And that's all I'm doing. So then, in this equation, if you remember, all I did was I added um, S time S L L G. That's the L G resistor. So now, what is the situation? We have omega naught equal to one over square root of L S plus L G C G S. So now we have an additional variable to control the corner frequency. And similarly, you could you know you could add uh, play with the capacitor, but playing with the capacitor is dangerous. Because then you're going to change your matching value, right? Omega t ls that value will change. So you have to do that judiciously. So let's uh, rs ls. So this is a series circuit, which is ls plus lg, and this is your cgs, and this is your real part of the. Omega T L S and this is your R S, right? So if you remember series R L C, uh, networks. Now you know why I did matching networks and all that stuff right early in the beginning because we are going to use those concepts continuously. Okay. So what is Q N now? You should be able to tell me immediately. Is resistance small or large? So it should be in the denominator or numerator. Denominator, good. So R, and then um, omega L, right? Or equal to one over omega C R. That's the Q. So in this case, what is the Q? Q at the input is equal to omega naught L G plus L S divided by R S plus omega T L S, or also equal to one over Omega naught CGS RS plus Omega T LS. All right, you have done that before. So voltage across the inductor and voltage across the capacitor, right? So VL is equal to VC. This is what we did in one of the lectures. Is equal to Q in times VS source resistance. So that's equal to two times Q in V S is equal to uh, sorry um, V S uh, is equal to two times. I'll explain just one second. I'll just draw a picture for you so it's clear. So let's say we do
CGS LS and this is your Omega T LS which is okay. So, I am defining this as VN and this is your VS and this is your RS right. So, VN by matching VN is equal to Vs divided by 2 right. So, that is what uh, that is all I am doing here in this expression. So, um, to look at this as a circuit right Id is equal to Gm times Vgs in the in the original MOSFET equations, but here now this becomes equivalent circuit. And then, uh, so so you get GM instead of VGS, we are applying VN, right? So that's two times QN and times VN. The capital GM, which is kind of the effective GM of this circuit, is two Q in times GM. So here is that extra gain effect due to Q. So, let me rewrite again Gm is equal to 2 Gm divided by omega naught Cgs Rs plus omega T Ls which this part is 2 times Rs and then that becomes, so this is 2 times Rs then we can write a Gm over Cgs divided by omega naught rs is equal to again omega t divided by omega naught rs ok. So, this gm effect is actually independent of the property of the transistor completely and it becomes uh, other than the omega t. I think I will stop at this point. Okay. All right. Any questions so far? Ah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. It is intentional. Many times it is preferred because you do not want to, uh, it gives you that additional filtering effect also. Yeah. You do not do this in broadband. Yeah. Correct. 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 Yeah. You do not do this for broadband LAs. Yeah. Yeah, we just went through that right few minutes ago. You missed it. Huh? Okay. Let me show you again. So that's the reason I did the inductor was the climax. The last part. We did resistor, we did the the capacitor. Huh? Correct, correct. Yeah, you can do that. You can drop, you can add capacitor across CGS. Okay. You are saying that instead of LG, add a capacitor, is it? Uh, what will that do to you? That will change your. Um, See, when you add two capacitors, what happens in series? So, where would your frequency go? It will actually go further up higher, right? So, you you will go beyond your, try to go beyond your FT of the device, right? In a way. I mean, you will go in the higher frequency and then the parasitics will co start coming into play. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, correct. You can do that too. That's what I said. Yeah. If you do that, then what happens? Of course, your your omega naught changes, but also what happens? The CGS is in the resistance equation, if you remember. So your matching will change too. So you have to kind of you you're trying to make them independent of each other, right? Unfortunately, the the biggest trouble with this is there are inductors, right? They're big. So what will happen is if you see these circuits. 
um, you will have big honking inductors and then there will be tiny device somewhere there and then to connect to that becomes a pain right because uh, now you have to make sure that those two inductors are are play layout wise this becomes a little bit not manageable. So, what people do typically also is the the resist the LS part is implemented using bond wires. So, bond wires are very good cue. So, you use the bond wire inductor because you have to go to the ground anyway. So, you have you will need a, a bond wire uh, to connect the source to ground. So, you use the bond wire inductor that is kind of the way it started actually this whole thing was developed uh, based on that when originally they were starting to do it. Is that part clear? The I mean, you can use bond wire instead of LS, the one that you put down in the in the source. All right, thank you.